After trying to topple Bashar al-Assad for six long years, the Syrian opposition is not just losing the war, but also losing support on the international stage. The U.S. has announced it's no longer focused on getting rid of Assad, and the U.N. special envoy to Syria has said if the opposition was planning to win the war, quote, facts are proving that is not the case. So how did it all go wrong? And in hindsight, was it a mistake for outside powers to have thrown their weight behind the armed opposition to Assad? Joining me to discuss this from London, veteran Middle East correspondent for The Independent, Patrick Coburn, who's reported on the war since its onset and is the author of the new book, Age of Jihad, and from New York, Mohammed Ala Ghanem, a policy advisor to the Syrian-American Council and former professor at the University of Damascus who's been involved in the Syrian uprising from the very beginning. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Mohammed, let me start with you. Even by the end of the Obama administration, it was pretty clear that the U.S. had given up on trying to get rid of Bashar al-Assad. Under Trump, that's now basically the official U.S. position. So, Mohammed, Assad gets to stay. He's won, hasn't he? No, he has not. Um, for sure, the Assad regime, its Iranian backers, its Russian backers, uh, and a cacophony of voices in the West are eager to declare Assad a victor. Um, but, um, you know, really... If you, if, what, what is the Assad regime right now? The Assad regime is not even the shadow of its former self. Assad is not winning. Iran is winning. Iran um, is getting its corridor to the Mediterranean. Russia is winning. Uh, the Assad regime in the process lost legitimacy, lost independence. Assad cannot travel around uh, the country. And um, on the ground, the Russians do the fighting. Hezbollah does the fighting. Iraqi militias do the fighting. And everyone knows that Assad troops are little more than uh, entertainment. Let me bring in Pat Patrick Coburn, you've been covering this war since the start in 2011. Is it your view that Assad has basically now won and it's over for the opposition, for the rebels? Yes, he clearly has won because he controls most of uh, the Syrian population, most of the populated areas. Uh, the Syrian army is uh, pretty strong. The, his main opponents, Islamic State, uh, are on the retreat. Um, and uh, he's got a superiority of forces that's not going to end. The only way the Western intervention would have overthrown Assad is if the firepower of the U.S. Air Force and its allies had been directed against Assad and in favor of the uh, armed opposition, just as they've given support to the Syrian Kurds or they've given support to the Iraqi army in northern Iraq. This would have transformed okay. things. But anything less and the, is just simply prolonged the war. So, Mohammed, was the war unnecessarily prolonged, as Patrick put it? I, I don't think so at all. Neither do uh, millions of Syrians, hundreds, at least hundreds of thousands of Syrians. The mistake that the community of nations or the international community has actually made is, was not extending real support. The opposition got a lot of rhetorical support, but there was nothing concrete to back it up on the ground. It was more like wishful thinking. We think Assad is going to fall, uh, so we're going to say that Assad is going to fall, but there was no real support. The mistake that the community of nations committed uh, and paid dearly for was actually not supporting Syrians in their quest for dignity and good governance. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of people would say, well, hold on, you know, the CIA at one stage, I think one dollar of every $15 of CIA's budget was going towards Syria operations. The Saudi, gave, Saudi government gave lots of money. The Turks opened their borders to fighters from abroad. The Qataris spent as much as $3 billion on the rebels in the first years. Are you saying none of that support counted? It was all irrelevant? Um, the, the CIA program that you're talking about is something I'm very familiar is, is an effort I was very familiar with. I've written about, and the program was a joke. The West was never interested in affording the Syrian opposition a military victory. They were not interested. American officials would tell you they, they don't want Assad to actually be toppled militarily. They wanted Assad to, the, to come to the negotiating table. So they're trying to turn up the heat against Assad on the ground a little bit. But it was it was very meager. It was very small. It was never meant to Billions make a Billions of dollars? That's why the Obama the Saudis, administration the Qataris, had the actually Americans, trouble. The now, think about it. You, you, uh, okay, yeah. you, brought up the, you brought up the Saudis. Briefly, you up and then the I'll Qataris. bring in Patrick. Do, do we have... You brought up the Saudis and the Qataris. Do we have Saudi troops on the ground in Syria? No. Do we have Iranian troops? Yes. Do we have Saudi uh, militias like the Iraqi militias in Syria fighting on, the beha on behalf of the okay. Syrian opposition? Fair no. point. Let's do we have a power? Do we have the United States actually fighting like okay. the Russians are fighting on behalf of the regime? All strong Those points. Let's have Patrick respond. Support. Patrick. I think that it's one of the problems is that the Syrian opposition has gone in for a lot of wishful thinking along the road, which 
hasn't enabled them to really see the situation on the ground. The problem is that the most effective armed opposition were uh, people supported, trained uh, by al-Qaeda in Iraq. They had the experience, they had the supply lines, and uh, so forth. Uh, so they immediately began to take over. They became the heart of the armed opposition. Even when they split between uh, ISIS and uh, al-Nusra, it was these extreme elements that uh, were in charge. And that the, was the great sort of political weakness of the opposition, which I think they never admitted to themselves. OK, let me ask, Mohammed. I just want to ask you, earlier you said the, the Western CIA support for the rebels was a joke. A lot of American officials might say, well, a lot of the rebels they supported were a bit of a joke. They would point to the fact that they gave weaponry to American, you know, American-backed rebels got weaponry, which was then handed over to groups like ISIS, al-Qaeda. In 2015, for example, Syrian rebels trained by the U.S. gave some of their U.S.-supplied weapons to the Nusra Front in exchange for safe passage through the country. That's undeniable. That happened, didn't it? That is actually not what CIA officials in charge of the program said. CIA, actually top CIA officials in charge of the program, uh, the, the, the top general in charge, um, so to speak, in, in charge of the program, continued to uh, argue for the program to continue, even under Mr. Trump, even under... Okay, but are you US saying that didn't President. happen? Are and you then, saying American bank Mr. rebels Trump, uh, never Mr. gave Trump, any equipment then, to al-Qaeda groups, right. regardless of whether Mr. the generals Trump, agree? Yeah, you're right. I mean, some, some of that happened, but think about it. Um, but not in any statistically significant way. Let me put that point to Patrick. Patrick, you said earlier that from the very beginning you thought that there was no real chance of the opposition winning a military victory against Assad. But what were you... What, but what should Syrians have done who were opposed to Assad, who were being killed by Assad? Should they have just surrendered because they had no chance or they were told by people like yourself that they had no chance? No, this is, this is very difficult, you know. Yeah. This isn't, you know, this isn't... Many Syrians, most Syrians I know, uh, felt they were choosing between bad and worse. Um, and they did think that the alternative was al-Qaeda or al-Qaeda-tipped uh, uh, linked organizations would take over if Assad fell. Uh, and that, of course, was a strength of Assad. Um, who is bad and who is worse, that in your analogy, there? Because Mohammed's saying the... Assad's much worse as the number one killer mm. of civilians. When you say bad and worse, in your view, Th that's who's bad what and who's worse. I think that most people in that's Damascus, you know, and other and elsewhere, really did think that, yeah, they would prefer to stick with Assad rather than have Islamic State take over um, the or Al Qaeda linked organizations. That was the weakness of the opposition. Uh, that the way the armed opposition had been taken over by them. I'm not saying that there's much they could have done about it. You know, there's a genuine tragedy here uh, which has faced the Syrian people, that there isn't an obvious alternative thing that they could have done. I just want to be clear on Sorry, one point, yeah. Patrick, because, yes, you're right, a lot of people do worry about ISIS and see beheadings and al-Qaeda atrocities, but the statistics suggest and most studies and reports suggest that the number one killer of civilians in Syria has been Bashar al-Assad. He's done barrel bombs. He's done torture. He's used... His militias have used rape. I mean, the major human rights abuse in Syria have been carried out by the regime, not by the rebels. Would you accept that? Yeah, I'd say that's probably true, but you have to... If you look at 400,000 dead, you know, this is a genuine civil war, uh, both sides merciless, with uh, almost a competition to commit atrocities on both sides, and both sides terrified of each other. That is absolutely not true. Okay. Both Mohammed. with hard core support. Assad is responsible for over 95% of civilian casualties in Syria. So, I mean, let's just please use some data so it's not an opinion that we're trying to propagate, or it's not propaganda. 95%, over 95% of civilians have been killed by ISIS. So I don't know how you can, you know, see that data and then say, I both sides are equally actually brutal and it's a civil war, so we have to accept 400,000 people killed. There there's a half of the population has been displaced, and it's been displaced not because, actually, not even because of ISIS. Uh, you know, ISIS has displaced a lot of people. But, but Mohammed, you have the mainly the Russian rights. Air Force, the Assad regime Air Force, and they're displacing people. That's why you have refugees in Europe. Okay. You have a, an international refugee okay. crisis. So let me ask That's you why a you have about ISIS the human rights attacks. issue that you raise, Mohammed. Regardless of equality, you don't deny, do you, that Syrian rebel groups have been involved in human rights abuses, have I worked with some awful mm, groups, Amnesty, I, Human Rights Watch. So, so here's my question. I, I think you do agree with that. You don't deny that. So here's my question. Is that one of the reasons your revolt failed? Because so many groups lost the confidence of areas they were controlling because they were carrying out beheadings and shootings and stonings? 
No, 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 that's not what people in Idlib would tell you. That's not what, it, what, what people in Aleppo, at least 400,000 in the city of Aleppo, who are ethnically well, cleansed and you don't uh, speak for all the people there, would yes. tell you. Here's what they would tell you. Here's what they would tell you. They would tell you, um, uh, first of all, violations, uh, infractions, etc., were committed by the Syrian opposition. And that is something we, we totally condemn, and that's uh, you know, something that uh, we, we always try to, to address. But again, what's the percentage? Um, people left because of barrel bombs, because the Russians used bunker buster bombs. Assad targeted hospitals, schools. So it's not just an issue of moral equivalency that I'm trying to make here. It's I'm trying to be pragmatic here. For but me if you're being pragmatic, I'm just wondering, would you concede at this stage, we started the discussion by talking about how the opposition's on the back for Assad has momentum. Isn't part of that the behavior of the rebels? People around the world looked at Syria and said, you know what, there's bad guys on both sides. Yes, one may be worse no. than the other, but the problem is the rebels didn't exactly cover themselves in glory. That Would is you not, concede that? That is not what Syrians and Homs, again, think about the major I'm not asking centers, about okay, Syrians, I don't want to talk in I'm general. Asking about the, Homs, I'm asking about the international community, which decided not to kind of throw its weight behind one side. The international they were worried. The, inaction, the inaction of the international community, and this conflict has been going on for six and a half years now, has definitely empowered extremists, because think about it. You have, again, tens of thousands of people in the Free Syrian Army. You starve them of, uh, of resources, and then you allow AQ to, uh, to act as they wish in the country and to recruit people. Patrick, weren't Syrians betrayed by the international community and pushed into the arms of these groups? Isn't that the problem? I think this has one been one of the weaknesses of the opposition, is this uh, completely unrealistic view of what was happening inside Syria and how people were responding. You know, if I'm sitting in Damascus and I see uh, ISIS in Palmyra beheading uh, people in the uh, theater there, if I see them setting fire to, uh, with petrol to people who they've captured, you know, I'm very frightened. I'm very frightened they're going to do the same to me but and my Patrick, family. But Patrick, and a lot of the frightened, Patrick, determined... that um, Assad uses extremism so let's to present us with either me or extremism. So let me put that so point to Patrick. if you would Patrick. like extremism to end, you have to end Assad. Let me put that point to Patrick. Patrick, that's true, isn't it? Yeah, that Assad yeah, has sure, always yeah, wanted you know, to uh, portray uh, the opposition as extremist, as run by al-Qaeda. Have journalists like yourself contributed to that narrative, helped him with that narrative? No, because, you know, every government in the Middle East, since I've been covering it, which is a long time, always tries to portray its opponents as extremists. You know, it's, it's a, a conspiracy theory and a very misleading one to think that ISIS, the Daesh, was somehow an invention of Assad. Uh, it wasn't. He took advantage of this. Militarily, it didn't do him much good. The existence of ISIS was politically uh, in the interests of Assad, unfortunately not militarily. Okay, let me ask you this. More than six years in, hundreds of thousands of dead. Do you both believe that there is still a diplomatic uh, solution to th that can bring this conflict to a proper end? Yes or no? Mohammed. War is a terrible thing, but in Syria, we need a war to end this war because the Chamberlain-like policy of appeasement of, of, uh, of the Assad regime in Syria over the past six and a half years has not worked. And we have a crisis now of epic proportions. So we need a war to end this war. Patrick? No, we, we, what, exactly what we don't want is more war, more Syrians killed, more refugees. Assad has won. I don't think that's great. I also think it would have been very bad if his opponents had won. A lot of things are still up in the air. But I think the idea of we should have more war to get rid of Assad, that I'm afraid the verdict is in. It, much better that we try and have some sort okay. of peace. Okay, gentlemen, we'll have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you both for joining me uh, on this episode of Upfront. That's our show. Upfront will be back next week.